Yeah, so I'll just uh, start by introducing myself. I am, my name is Zainab Adams, and I work for SAFC as the fleet coordinator. Uh, fleet is the faith leader environmental advocacy um, training coordinator. Um, but before we start, uh, because we are a multi-faith organization, I'd like to ask my two colleagues if they could open us up with a prayer. Uh, we'll start with Reverend um, Barry Bear, who is our faith leader liaison officer. Um, and then following her, we'll go to uh, Gabriel Manyangatsi from Zimbabwe, who is our uh, food and climate justice coordinator. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Zainab. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Please join me. On the days when our minds are disturbed and our hearts are sore, let us turn our eyes to the hills and feel the healing in their beauty. When we are in pain, let us walk in the ocean and feel her cooling balm. On the days when we do not know where to turn, let us turn to nature, which provides for sustenance, our healing and our comfort. The creator God has given all of these things unto us. Let us therefore give thanks and fall to our knees in reverence and care of divine wisdom, planning and constancy. Oh my God, the one God who is known by so many names. We give thanks, we give thanks, we give thanks and we accept the care of the duty of care that is given to us in return. Amen. Let us pray further. Sovereign Lord, God the Almighty, we come before your throne of mercy as the human race and ask for your forgiveness for the things that we have done that have altered that which you made, which was good. Forgive us, God the Almighty, for those things that we have failed to do, neglected, ignored, and kept silent on when that which you made good was being ruined and continues to be ruined. We pray for strength to speak and to act when that which is good is being vandalized and is under threat. Help us to always examine our ways so that they are in sync with your will, that all will be very good in your sight. Instilling us the courage to speak, to speak out when injustice is being perpetrated on the environment. Steer in us the spirit of fairness when the whole creation is groaning because of our action or inaction. We pray today that you will help us in our deliberations so that together we will be able to act so that we will restore that which was made good. We pray that together we will be able to come to our senses and enable life to thrive and glorify your name. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control of our situation and direct our steps towards justice for your entire creation. Heavenly Father, we pray for your continued presence and protection as we labor in your vineyard. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, thank you both. That was uh, beautiful. Um, I would like to say thank you to everyone who has joined the call. We are now on 56, well, 57. I'm just letting um, Esther in. Um, we're on 57 people, and we've got over 150 registrations for this, for this call alone. So that was amazing. We only expected about 18, um, but it's amazing how people... Um, are starting to take 
um, your own eco footprint and the eco footprint of your organization or institution, your faith institution seriously and wanting to make that change. Um, I will welcome now Francesca de Gasperis, who's um, the SAFSI um, ED, Executive Director, just to say hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So good to see you online here today. Welcome to this session. And uh, it's an absolute thrill to be meeting with you across the region. I see some people are sending their greetings in the chat. And I'm just wondering, where is everyone from? And maybe you could put where you're from in the chat, um, what country you're from, what location. We know with such a big audience, and we're just thrilled to have such a big audience, that some of us are going to be hopefully right next door to each other, but not realizing it. Um, but also we're quite widespread, so we're really representing an incredible part of our region. As many of you know, SAFSI is the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute, which means we're a regional entity, and we are working across the region. Um, many of us SAFSI staff team are here in Cape Town, so greetings from Cape Town. Um, and it's great to see some of you are here in South Africa. And of course, we don't want to be too South Africa centric. So I hope that uh, those of you who are not in South Africa will also be putting your where you are in the chat. Um, so some of you may be new to SAFSI. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you and to say hi to our old friends and to our new friends. Um, Eco footprinting is one of the ways that we can measure um, our own footprint on the earth. What sort of pressure are we putting on the earth? Is it a heavy one? Are we wearing big boots? Are we driving in a tractor making big indents in the ground? Or are we walking lightly? And the idea of that is it's not just about reducing your pressure on the earth, but actually taking a fair amount. For some people where we live, we don't have access to affordable electricity, for example. That happens in South Africa, and I'm sure it happens in other places too. Electricity either isn't being provided to communities or it's not affordable. So we find that people um, aren't able to um, study, to cook, to read, to be together with sufficient electricity. And today we're talking about where we get our power from. That's the particular theme of today's session. Um, and energy and climate justice is one of, one of our SAFSI's core programs. It's something we're particularly interested in. And we're particularly interested in hearing from faith leaders about the challenges you're facing. Is it an access issue? Is it that your, your, the decision makers in your country are making poor decisions on behalf of the citizenry? And what can we do as people of faith? What can we do as faith leaders to support our communities to have affordable access to electricity so that we see the decision makers are actually making good decisions in our names? These are the questions that SAFSI asks and some of the things we're going to start to explore with you today. The eco footprinting approach really is a very practical one. So the idea is that you come away from this session as having some really practical tools about what can you do or what can your faith community do. And SAFSI talks specifically around faith leaders and faith communities because that's the particular lens with which we look at the world. We believe that people of faith have a moral responsibility. We have a duty to care for earth. And that in, in fact is our vision, people of faith caring for living earth. The earth and our relationship with the earth is something that we are wanting to restore and repair. And we believe that this is something that we are called to do from our faith perspectives, from our sacred connection with the earth. And I'm sure many of you feel the same way and that's why you've come today. Or maybe you've come for a much more practical reason. Whichever reason brought you here today, we're very interested to hear from you and we're very interested to hear about the challenges that you are facing to see how practically we can support each other. And that's one of the reasons why we asked you please to say where you're from because 
then we can be linking with each other and giving each other peer support wherever we are. It may be uh, organizing yourselves where you're next door to each other. What can we do together? It may be finding out practical ways that um, you can work with others wherever you are to address some of the bad decision-making that's going on or good decision-making going on. How do we promote good energy decision-making? We, of course, want to see a just transition for Africa. We're interested in seeing uh, a move away from fossil fuels, a move away from nuclear energy. These are very costly, toxic, expensive, and tend to be more corrupt, unfortunately, in terms of their energy deliverance. Uh, that is what history has taught us. And we want to see more decentralized, localized, renewable energy systems. This is what faith communities can do. Because in a faith community, you're a group of people. You can look at something that you could perhaps do for your local church, your local mosque, or even another sort of community space that can benefit the community as a whole. These are the kinds of initiatives that SAFSI is interested in supporting and really highlighting. This is the role of faith leadership that you can play in your community, that you can play across Africa, that you can say to your governments and other decision makers, this is the kind of decentralized energy system that actually works for people, that addresses some of the energy needs, that makes energy something that really benefits everyone. So that's all from me today. I'm sure you're gonna have a wonderful session with Zainab, your wonderful facilitator, and also Kim. I can't see Kim at the moment, but I'm sure she's here somewhere. Um, it's great to see all of you commenting in the chat. It's, it's really wonderful to be here, and I'm looking forward to this session too. I always learn something new from you all. Um, as long as I've been working on eco-footprinting and energy, there's always something new to learn from each other. And there's always new challenges to tackle together. So thanks, Zainab, and back over to you. Thank you, Francesca, uh, for that warm welcome. We are still letting people in as we speak, and I think it's going to take a while before everyone gets here. But I think that we should start with our program. Um, I would like to introduce Kim Krishna, who is our um, We'd like to call her Ao, but she's not ours. Um, she is an eco audit specialist um, and has a master's um, degree in environmental studies from UCT. So Kim wrote a little, a, a little, a few sentences about herself. She says, um, I'm on a journey to live more lightly on earth. On this journey, I am learning how to make different choices and how to use different technologies and not rely heavy on supermarkets and ESCOM's electricity, which is so easily disconnect, uh, which so easily disconnects us uh, from the source of all I use. On this journey, I am learning from others and, sh and I'm sharing what I learned. So thank you very much for that brief description um, of your personal experience, Kim. I can't say Kim, can I say Kim? Kim. Hi, Zainab. Hi, everybody. Oh, there you are. Can you see me? Because my screen I can't see you. I oh, see hi. a white, white background. So weird. I wonder why it's not. I see it moving. Is your camera in the right direction? Are you facing? Oh, oh thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Technology. <laughs> can't get used oh, to technology. Much better. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, yeah. so Kim, just Hi, from Kim. SAFC, um, thank you very much. I know that we've been doing this for a number of years with you in communities, but I think that one thing we can take away, positive that we can take away from COVID is that we are able to do this in a setting like this with 64 people and not necessarily in groups like we used to do when we do it physically, where there's just 10 to 15 people um, in a room. And this just spreads the message quite faster and wider. Um, and that is what we're using this platform for. So I'm, I'm quite in awe of this call because we have people, as you can see in the chat, from all over, which is fantastic, um, which means that the work spreads a bit, um, faster. 
Um, so yeah, over to you, Kim. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. And yes, COVID has certainly um, changed our lives and in some positive ways, reset our value systems. Um, obviously, some of us have been traumatized by very personal experiences of illness and even death. Um, but it's so nice to be able to see you without any masks. So we take some of the small um, positives. Um, and one of the big positives for me has been the incredible support in um, communities, people coming together to look after each other and to also provide different ways of doing things. And in a sense, that's basically what the eco footprinting is about. It's about understanding our impact and also our community impact and how we can work together to reduce that so that we live in balance with nature. I've got um, some PowerPoint slides that I'd like to show you, but as soon as I go into that, then I disappear, which isn't a problem. But before I do that, I'd like to show you, um, Sepsi produced oh, probably about four, four years ago, um, an eco audit user guide. And today, because we're quite a big group and we from all over Southern Africa, I'm not going to go through it. Usually in the eco footprinting process, I go through this guide because it shows us very clearly how to measure our water use, our energy use, how to look at our waste and to reduce that. And at the back of the guide, it's got a whole lot of tables that show you which appliances typically use a lot of water, which use energy. And it also has templates for you to then use these to measure your own consumption at home or at work or in your faith center. So it's very, it's quite technical. And for this kind of webinar, I feel it's just too um, difficult because, um, because we, we're a bit distanced by being on webinar. And I can't stand up and show you on a big board or walk around a room and point things out to you. Like, you know, this light is energy, energy efficient, this one isn't. So um, I'm just going to appeal to you in the presentation, there is a link to this, um, this guide that I'm telling you about on SAPSI's website. So to really um, have a look at your consumption and help to measure it. I suggest that you go onto the website and have a look at this. I'm sure we can possibly in a follow-up email send everybody the link as well, um, just to make that easier. So if that's okay, I'm going to jump into the PowerPoint, which means I need to do a share screen. If Zainab would just help me. Um, and um, what I'm hoping to do is give some ideas of some of the alternatives that I'm aware of and the exciting part of, about being in this big group is that you've all um, looked at alternatives that work for you and some that don't. And it's actually going to be about sharing what works for individual households, faith communities, and what works for communities. So I'm hoping just to give some ideas that will trigger um, a, a bigger discussion around what alternatives are there in terms of behavior and technology that can help us all reduce our eco footprint. Okay, Zainab, shall I click on share screen? Getting there. Um, control, sorry. Is that coming up? Yeah, it takes a second, it's up now. Oh, oh great, okay. So, I'm gonna start the slideshow. Okay, I've got a little square of some of our faces on the corner, so I hope that doesn't, um, yeah, but you, you probably can't see that. Hopefully you can see the whole screen. So as, um, as Gabriel and Barry and um, Francesca have already pointed out, um, that as people of faith, who believe in a creator God, um, we really need to ask ourselves, are we living in a healthy partnership with, um, with nature? And how do we live in a balance so that we have human and well-being, both physical and spiritual, without um, destroying 
or impacting too severely on the rest of creation's ability to also live um, with well-being. Um, so one way of measuring this is to look at what is an eco footprint. And as the picture on the left shows you, right now in certain societies in the world, we, are, we have such a huge material footprint. The resources that we need from nature that are to provide our food, our homes, our vehicles, our office spaces, and all of our lifestyle choices, frivolous and, and essential, are actually using a huge amount of the Earth's resources to the extent that if we carry on like this, there will be no, the collective human footprint will leave no space for, for wild nature and for undisturbed spaces, places. Sorry, this screen is so white, I'm battling to find the arrow. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so how big is your eco footprint? This is like the classic stereotype of Western, of Western person with lots of material accruements. And um, we can see that it's, if we all lived like that, or if we all aspired to live like that, we would need multiple Earths to provide all the resources, the energy, the water, the raw materials, that go into that. This is a very nice um, graph from um, the natural step. And it's basically showing at the top how as human population and human demands are increasing demand for more and more um, impacts on the earth. So the earth's resources are declining here at the top of this blue arrow. Um, so we're asking for more and more from nature um, but there's less and less to give as our, as our demands increase. And you can see the earth as a little ball bouncing between this space, which is getting narrower. The good news is that earth has demonstrated repeatedly that it has a phenomenal ability to recover. So um, it's basically about looking at our impacts through our eco footprint so that um, we stop the mass loss of biodiversity, we stop the climate disruption, we stop water pollution, and we stop degraded soil. And all of these things are important for nature, but actually they're important for us because nature has been through five previous extinctions and it will survive. But if we want to survive as a civilization with well being for all of humanity, we're going to look at how to live in a better balance. So there are currently about 7.8 billion of us with 7.8 billion dreams. Um, we need to consume with care so that nature can repair. Then a question specifically for people of faith, does nature have rights too? Um, what does your faith say about the human nature relationship? I'm not going to go into that in detail now, but it's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. So um, this Eco Footprint program, which is going to run over a couple of weeks, includes today, which will focus on energy. Um, the following Monday, we'll be looking at water. And then the Monday after that, we'll be looking at waste. And then we're hoping to have a report back webinar where we all come together and discuss what we've learned and what new ideas we can collectively share. This is the booklet that I spoke to you about at the beginning of the program, and we'll send you the link. So if we're focusing on energy and balancing our energy needs, the two essential issues, and I think this photograph from outer space that only shows a segment with the whole of Africa and part of Europe is very illustrative. It shows us two basic things. There's unequal access to, um, to energy, which has um, implications for development, for health, and also for environment by using then, um, if you don't have access to clean energy resources, then there's an environmental impact as well. And then if you look more closely at Europe, massive inefficient use of energy, which also has human and environmental health implications. Um, and completely unsustainable impacts. I mean, this is at night and look how lit up everything is. That is an incredibly inefficient use, waste of energy. So 
the one thing we have to understand, even though we're having three different workshops um, with energy, water, and waste, energy is in every single thing we do. So um, when we throw something away um, because we don't recycle it or we can't recycle it, we're actually throwing energy away. We need energy to pump and to purify our water. We need um, all of our buildings, our food, everything contains energy and the raw materials and water. Nature knows no waste, so why do we? If we look historically at our use of energy, and I think this is particularly relevant today because we are going through an energy transition. Um, we all know that fossil fuels are um, a non-renewable resource, so we're actually running out of them. And then there's the huge issue of all the um, pollution and climate change issues around fossil fuels, around fossil fuel use. But if we look at how we used to use energy in the past, we started off as um, as land-based agricultural societies where animal labor and, and, and then dung, which we used to, to burn. Um, we also used wood, charcoal, those were original energy sources. They're unsustainable if they're extracted to the extent that it results in deforestation and soil damage, which in certain parts of the world is happening. If we move up um, at the beginning of the industrial revolution, fossil fuel and the combination of the internal combustion engine gave um, humanity an incredible technological leap. And we became much more efficient or I should say a productive in terms of producing all sorts of the kind of things we almost take for granted today. Um, but our incredible use of fossil fuel has resulted in the pollution and climate change that we have talked about. And also it's ultimately not re renewable. Then we've also, because fossil fuel is so energy dense and it was very cheap and there was lots of it, we were, those who had access to it were essentially spoiled. So we had overconsumption of electricity generated by this fossil fuel, um, which was massive wastage and a lot of luxury. Now, if we look on the other side at, the, at an energy transition, it requires a transition to renewable energy, looking at green, um, looking at wind, solar, wave, um, bio, bio um, gas, and a whole lot of other technology, battery storage technologies, we still learning to improve so that they can be more efficient. I do need to say one thing, we talk about clean um, energy from renewable resources, wind and sun are renewable, but the met metals that go into making wind turbines and solar panels are not renewable. Um, in Congo right now, there are horrific stories of child labor and all sorts of yeah, cartels, essentially stealing rare earth metals that are being used in the um, electronics industry to regulate um, smart electricity. So when we talk about renewables, we must talk about it with a new mindset, with a mindset of care for the earth and not just taking the old way of using fossil fuel into new, um, new renewable technology, because then we'll have the same um, well, we'll have, we will have resource extraction and um, people being denied access to essential resources as well. So um, fossil fuel, we're running out of it. We need to reduce consumption because of climate change. There's some services that we cannot replace right now. So it's about reducing our consumption of fossil fuel and shifting as fast as we can. There's a new look at, um, at um, plant and animal matter specifically in biogas, and I'll talk about that later on. Um, there are quite a few very clever, innovative people from all over, not just you know fancy engineers at universities who are cooking on biogas. Um, but we do need to remember that these, although they're renewable, it's about the level of, exploit, of extraction. So we need to replant. We can't just keep harvesting. So energy issues, as all of us here will probably know, are um, affordable access is a problem for many, many people. And in fact, it's becoming a problem for almost everybody with the incredible electricity increases in South Africa. I'm not sure about in the rest of Africa about the actual costs. 
Um, energy becomes more critical in winter where, where people need more energy to keep warm and also more indoor cooking. Um, then wood for fuel is becoming increasingly difficult to get. Um, and so there's an impact with natural areas being devegetated. Houses historically were not properly designed. They were inefficient, badly insulated with lots of drafts. And then our authorities at every level, at a, a community, village, city, and um, state level are really battling to provide um, the, the infrastructure to keep the lights on at um, an affordable level. So we're surrounded by sun and wind, but um, up until fairly recently, it's been un unavailable to lower income communities, although there are some positive shifts in terms of partnerships and cheaper technology that will hopefully change this. So while we all need to look at our individual environment footprint, it's critical for us to also tackle energy as communities. Um, this is particularly important because if the um, if our cities and our towns and our local and our governments are battling to provide us with affordable, clean energy, then it makes sense for us as communities to see what role we can play. Um, and this also begs the question of what role can faith leaders play? Um, because it's far more effective and efficient to set up a mini solar grid system as a community rather than as a group of independent households. Um, so also we need to make sure that as we transition to renewable energy, that everybody is included. Um, so we need to lobby for energy for all as communities. And this begs the question, what is the role of faith leaders? Faith, um, faith um, property and buildings are an opportunity for installing um, solar solar panels, which can then be used to feed electricity into surrounding houses. And on the right here is this green turtle, which is um, a very clever, um, like mini business, where you have a container and these solar panels charge batteries, and then people come and exchange batteries which they then take home to run their lights and their um, charge their cell phones and laptops. Obviously it can't run in a whole house, but it can provide essential com communication and lighting. Um, yeah, it can provide energy for that. So where do you start? Um, and I need to, there's no quick fix. It's like most, most big changes, um, reducing, finding the best energy footprint. So for some people, it's about getting access to energy. And for other people, it's about using the energy they have more efficiently. It's not a, it's not a quick fix, it's a journey. Start with, with the easy things because success leads to more success. So efficient lighting, efficient cooking. Just as a general principle in a home, probably also a faith center, the most energy intensive um, activities are cooking, heating, water, space heating so and space cooling. Um, so let's, I'm now gonna go through a couple of examples and this is where I hope, oh, sorry, I'm first going to quickly talk about electricity. Then we're gonna go through a whole lot of examples of alternatives. And this is where I hope you will be able to give us ideas about what is working in your own homes or in your own communities. So um, is electricity your main source of energy apart from transport? If so, over the, certainly in South Africa, I'm not sure obviously about uh, other Southern African experience, but our electricity used to be very cheap. So people didn't really take, if you had electricity, you didn't really take notice of what you, you know, how you used it. It has increased in price over 300% in the last 10 years. So it's really important for us to start understanding how we use our electricity um, and rather look at the units that you use rather than the money, because the money changes all the time. Every single year, our electricity goes up. This year, our electricity, ISCOM electricity has gone up by 15%. So if you want to reduce and you want to understand what appliances are using electricity, it's important to look at how many units of electricity, the so-called kilowatt hours they're using. And to help you to do this, um, that book I was telling you about earlier has got tables in that can help you to do that. 
again, because electricity was fairly cheap, we didn't really think about it. So people didn't bother to understand what tariff they were on. And all energy utilities across Africa will have got different tariffs for different users, for business, for, for homes. Find out what that tariff is and make sure you're on the right tariff. Then um, it's one of the, um, the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is that everybody has access to sufficient energy for their, um, for their well-being. So uh, quite a few countries and South Africa has introduced a free basic electricity that they give you an amount of free basic, free basic electricity or free basic alternative energy, which is um, a voucher to get gas or paraffin and that's specifically for houses that are not connected to the electrical grid. Find out if your country has something like that. Um, and in South Africa, find out if you don't, find out what the qualification um, is for the different households. It is on, it is on the various government websites. Um, I can give you that information for South Africa, but I don't, I can't obviously give it to you for, for other countries. Then SAPSI has an explanation of how the tariffs work. We just need to um, create a user-friendly info sheet that can be, can be shared. Okay, so moving on from electricity, sorry, just need to find the, this. so yeah, so moving on from grid tied electricity, let's, let's look at uses of energy. So let's start with lighting um, and, charging cell phones and, and computers and, and simple electronics. Televisions are also fine. As soon as you go to electric stoves and, um, fr and large fridges, um, it's, yeah, you, it's very difficult to use solar. But certainly for, um, for, for lighting and charging um, small electrical appliances, if you're using grid electricity, replace all your old incandescent bulbs and even your compact fluorescence. The compact fluorescent is this one in the middle. The reason why that is not a, an eco-friendly bulb is it's full of mercury. And it's very difficult even in South Africa, which is supposed to have a fairly sophisticated recycling system. It's very hard to get them responsibly disposed of. But um, LED lights, which have come down considerably in price and also now last longer than the first ones that were brought out, use a fraction. If you look at the figures at the bottom, an old incandescent light can use um, the smaller one, 60 watts up to hundred. For the same lighting, you can get a three or a seven watt light. So in terms of reducing your electricity consumption, um, that makes a lot of sense. And certainly in terms of putting a solar system in place, you can put in a small solar system because your lighting is only demanding, you can have a number of lights that demand three watts instead of having to put in a massive solar system that most of us can't afford. Um, then, then there are, oh, just for example, um, I was speaking to somebody the other day and they were buying, um, because they are off grid, they were spending 50 rand on can, a packet of candles a week. So in South African terms, that's 200 rand um, a month, you can you can buy at least three, possibly even four um, LED lights for the price of those um, candles. And then the, the lights last, whereas the candles you have to keep buying every single month. So there are now a whole lot of solar home systems. Um, and I know in the various NGOs also offering them across Africa for, um, for homes. And as I said, they don't provide for your fridge or your stove but they certainly give you lighting for education, for security, and allow you to charge your phone and laptop and sometimes a, 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 um, a, well, a computer and a television, depending on the size. Then looking at cooking, um, during COVID, a whole lot of soup kitchens um, started up and existing ones it increased their um, production and they started using Wonder Bags. Um, I can't see the chat, but I really hope that a lot of you know about um, Wonder Bags. I remember speaking to Sheikh Kasim and some friends from Malawi, and they were very excited about Wonder Bags. And um, I really hope that, that um, 
yeah, that they're also able to access them now. But so the wonder bags are on the right, and these are ladies from a community that that I'm quite close to, who have, are demonstrating how to use a wonder bag to keep your food warm. So to cook it as well. But you first have to put it on the stove, bring it up to temperature. Depending on what it is, you have to cook it for up to five minutes. Then you put it into the the wonder bag, and it carries on cooking. Um, if you look on the left, this is how you make a wonder box. The two pictures at the bottom are wonder boxes that I made um, for this for this presentation. And I kept a, a pot over here of boiling water, two liters of boiling water put in the pot. Um, after eight hours, the boiling water had gone from um, 80, 98 degrees to um, 60 degrees exactly the same as the wonder bag so i tested it with the with the wonder box that i just made from a supermarket cardboard box with some polystyrene and the, then an, an old blanket that i have you can use towels track suits um it's amazing it really really does work and save electricity then alternatives for people in the countryside who use wood instead of having an open fire you can use, these are called rocket stoves. There's, this is an example of a commercially bought one. This is one you can simply make using bricks. And this is a gentleman who was involved with, um, with a project to revegetate area in our community, but we first had to get rid of some of the Australian wattle. And he's making his coffee on a rocket stove that he's feeding with little twigs on the, on the ground. Um, then just a reminder, if you are using wood, the earth asks you to please plant and protect the trees. So plant them and then when they're small, enclose them. And when you harvest, chop off branches rather than chopping down the whole tree. And this is very exciting. It's cooking with um, biogas. So at the top, we have our traditional KDAC stove, a uh, KDAC uh, gas that you buy from the shops. Um, but um, there are a whole lot of people um, who are now making methane gas, which you can cook with, um, and uh, with very, very simple instruments, with big plastic drums. These are um, three old um, oil, you know, the old 44 gallon drums. Um, and you're using plant waste materials. So anything that comes from the house, you can um, uh, uh, manure, you can use human manure. Uh, people are a bit um, don't really like that idea, but you don't have to use that. You can then just use plant material. The benefit of a biogas digester is that you get liquid fertilizer. So even though you're using plant material, you're not taking it out of the natural environment. You're just going to put it back in a different form. You'll put it back as liquid fertilizer and you'll have gas for cooking. Um, in water heating, of course, um, there's the traditional electric geyser. It is one of the biggest consumers of energy in a building. In a house, it can use up to 30% of your electrical energy. So to reduce that, um, you need to turn the timer down, the um, temperature down. These geysers are set from the, at the factory with very high temperature setting. You need to turn it down to 60 degrees. You can put a timer on it so that it doesn't, uh, it's not on all day, or else you can switch it on just before, an hour before you want to have a shower. Um, and then if it's a, a very cheap geyser, you need to insulate it with a blanket because otherwise it, it loses a lot of heat um, and we're using electricity to heat it. On the left, there are a couple of um, examples of how you can use the sun. So the commercial solar hot water system, which is obviously more expensive. Um, but once you install it, you don't need to pay for heating your water. Um, we have one at home and it's actually not connected to ESCOM. Um, it's so, so if it is, it's not directly connected. We actually have to turn it on if we have three days of um, no sun. Um, but it's not automatically connected, which is good because when it's automatically connected, then it always trickle feeds um, electricity from ESCOM, which you don't need. This is, I'm sure all of you have seen a black, black, um, coil of piping, it gets incredibly hot, it can burn you. The only problem is you can't store, you can't store it. We also use these, um, it's a solar suitcase, 
which is a clear plastic bag inside a black box. The water also goes up to 70 degrees, um, but of course you can't store it unless you put it in your wonder bag, which is what we do. Um, and then it will keep warm until nine o'clock at night and then you can have warm water. Right, so I've given you a couple of small ideas um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your own ideas about how to reduce our energy footprint. So um, the first thing is just to recap and think about you can be the change. Everybody can make a difference and all of our small differences will collectively make a very significant difference. So choose efficiency um, and what is essential rather than excess. And um, I think Zainab's favorite one, and it is a universal truth, each one teach one. Now, um, at the end of this, there are just two last slides and they're more kind of, um, I'd like to tell you the story. Margaret Mead was a, um, very highly regarded um, anthropologist, that somebody who looks at um, traditional human societies and what we can learn from them. Um, she also used to look at, um, at very ancient societies, hunter-gatherer communities, and she found this fossil bone. Well, um, actually it wasn't fossilized, it's a bone in a grave um, from a society thousands of years ago. The, this is a leg bone and it's broken. And she said, for her, the first sign of civilization wasn't technological achievement, but it was evidence of compassion. She said somebody had to look after that person um, until their bone healed. And you can see it didn't heal particularly well, because obviously they didn't have doctors in those days. And the, the natural healers probably didn't know how to heal bones uh, in a sophisticated way but somebody took the time to care for this person. Um, and that she said is actually what is going to, is the first sign of human civilization is caring for each other rather than just advancing technology. And our behavior, not our technology is going to decide our energy future. Then finally, just a reminder that we are part of nature. Um, there's lots of technological information out there that can help us transition to living in a way that's more in balance with nature. But it's actually our motives and our values that are going to motivate us. Um, are we, do we still see ourselves? Sorry, this is a man. It's basically supposed to be a man and, and, a, and a woman. <laughs> do we still see ourselves as the top of the ecological pyramid and separate from nature? Or do we see ourselves embedded in nature where we are in a partnership with all other living beings? Um, yeah, so thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And I'm looking forward to hearing all your ideas about how we can build a community that cares for us in nature and what technological and behavioral changes we can make to that will allow us to enjoy spiritual and physical well-being. Thank you. I will go out of share. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I can see the chat box is going. Um, please remember that we will do comments and chats, um, comments and questions um, after all the, uh, when we're done with presentations. Um, I see there's lots of our colleagues from Malawi um, asking questions about Malawi. Um, examples or what Malawi can do, um, as well as I'm sure other countries that's on here has the same question. Um, Kim, can I stop sharing? Yes, stop? please. Thank you. <laughs> I just don't know how to do that on my oh. end. Let I went see. on to share and wanted me to give a new share. So I think you have to stop the share. <laughs> um, stop. Oh, wait, Something. stop share. Stop okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't Great. know if that was me or you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just want to say that because we are um, in South Africa, SAFC is based in South Africa, uh, but we work in Southern Africa, we always try and get Southern African context as well. So for the Malawians that has been asking the question, what can Malawi do? We do have a presentation. Um, I see that 
Sheikh Kasim is here and he has been responding to the chats um, in the chat box. But I am looking for Reverend Chimambo. Reverend? Reverend Chigambo from uh, Uganda, are you here? Yes, I am here. Oh, there you are. I can hear your voice. I'm happy. Yes, here I am. Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Good to thank you. I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for coming. Welcome. Thank you for coming. So, so the reason why we've asked um, Reverend Chigambo to come on is that we recognize, as, as, as I said, we acknowledge that we're in South Africa and the context that, um, that we present in, um, especially Kim, might not be suitable for, for other countries. And so Reverend Chigambo has been working on um, power saving um, alternative uh, projects, which he will tell us about, and that might inspire those in Uganda. After Reverend uh, Chigambo, we will look. At, we will listen to Sheikh Kasim, who is in Malawi, who has been working with us for quite some time, and he will tell you about his experience. So I'll just I'll just introduce um, Reverend Chigambo quickly. Uh, Reverend Chigambo is an ordained pastor in the Pentecostal Assemblies of God in Uganda. Um, he has been a pastor, institutional instructor, and associate, an associate regional uh, leader for, plus, uh, for over 20 years. Um, he has been involved in community development as a board member for more than 10 years and passionate about his faith community demonstrating um, the love of God to others around. Thank you very much for joining us, Reverend. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Zainab. And uh, thank you very much, Kim, for the presentation. That was uh, very much encouraging. And uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'll go quickly to what to one of my passion, why I am so much passionate and very happy for the partnership with the fleet or the being in the team fleet. What drives me? what moves me into caring for the environment and helping the faith community that uh, I, read, I read directly to be concerned about the community is because I believe that uh, much as we, I, we preach the gospel of salvation, that uh, people can be forgiven their sins, but also the, the, the environment, the creation, also needs to hear to have to, is part of the redeeming gospel the redeeming gospel of god which he gives that and the, one of the scriptures that really drives me to that comes from genesis where god created adam and eve and he says he put them in the garden and he, he put them in the garden to keep and tend to keep and tend so that's one of the things that makes me passionate about caring for the for the for the environment and the leading the faith community that I lead towards that. Now, energy saving alternatives. Mainly, I have taken the mainly I uh, I have taken the context of semi urban and the rural Uganda, rural Uganda and the semi urban. I live in Uganda. That's actually four hundred kilometers southwest of the capital city Kampala. So I live really in the rural part of Uganda. So and that's where I have been serving most of my time. For more than 20 years, I live in rural Uganda. So the context I have taken in this short presentation is the semi-urban and the rural Uganda. As a way of background, energy sources in Uganda traditionally we have firewood, we've had firewood, and uh, that's what uh, even our grandparents and our fathers and we ourselves also use. So firewood, it is still the main source in our rural areas. And even in the urban areas, the outskirts of urban areas, most of the 
the source of fire, the source of energy for cooking is really firewood, and it's also used a lot in semi-urban in semi-urban areas. Then the kerosene or paraffin. Paraffin is also used for lightening. It is used for lightening and sometimes alongside candles, just like Kim was saying. Charcoal, this is the main source of cooking in all urban areas and also in rural areas. Charcoal and this is very much unfriendly to the environment, to the slopes, to the, the as the urban places really depend on charcoal. So this is very, very much unfriendly and it's really devastating to our to our to to, to our environment. Then, but in of course, in recent times, while we have firewood and the paraffin and charcoal for a long time, and the, but in the recent time, we have hydropower, electricity for lightning, and the, also rarely. Okay, also this is the rarely used for cooking. Hydro is the rarely used for cooking, and the reason it's rarely used for cooking or for heating water is like like at home. I, I only, we, we only use, like at home, I only use the electricity for lighting and ironing and, the, and, and make charging those electronics, but cooking and heating water, that would be very, very much expensive. In the recent past, also small solar panels, small solar panels for light are usually scattered even in the rural areas. They are common in the rural Uganda and there are solar lamps that are coming in as so in the most recent past in our semi area, semi semi urban areas and rural areas, there is the coming of electricity and then those smaller solar panels usually used for lighting only. So having said that on the background of what are the sources of energy, they are still very limited to the ordinary citizen that is the electricity and and, 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 and solar power and solar and solar energy they are still very limited to the ordinary citizen due to the cost involved so the main source is still charcoal and firewood which is not environmental friendly and so in the energy saving interventions that are sub, that, that are being promoted in our in our communities and the our faith community, uh, we have the the we, we have the energy saving stoves. We have energy save, saving stoves, and uh, these like uh, which uh, they still use charcoal and firewood, but they take forty percent of the fuel. Uh, I mean, the forty percent of the fuel that would be required. So somehow it re, it reduces both on the cost. And if it is used commonly, if it is used widely, then also maybe it would do it. It would reduce the the weight of the footprint on the environment. So because it these energy saving stoves will use about forty percent of the required fuel. Then we have firewood saving. Also, the, the, the another way it's also like stoves, but this would be cool. This would be built built within the cooking area like uh, instead of uh, cooking store in, in, instead of cooking stones it would be built built up and it uses less firewood one can actually put more than one saucepan at a go on this on this uh, this place on that uh, cooking place then uh, of course the fire the, there is the fireless cooker which Kim mentioned, he, he called it the wonder bug, the wonder bug, and the, sometimes we've called it the fireless. I'm sorry, I think I, I did not ask to share the screen. I didn't know how to do about that, but I would have, I, I, I had some images, but the fireless cooker or the wonder bug is also, we, we talk about it, but not very many people are using it yet. With all these, the energy saving stoves and the, uh, the fire, place that is developed to take a little firewood and the fireless cooker, they are not yet very much used 
and I think one of the, one of the problem we face is compliance. The people mainly get used to something and they keep on doing it. It's very rare to move them, but we do slowly by slowly and but also being very vigilant in it because people are not easily compliant towards the, the, the idea. So anyway, briefly, that's what uh, I thought I would bring in on what uh, the alternative, the, the nature of energy, not really the all over Uganda, because all over Uganda, but I've been mainly talking about this rural part of Uganda, which I mentioned, it's, it's 400 kilometers southwest of uh, southwest of uh, Kampala, and maybe in the, about 90, 100 kilometers north of Chigali in Rwanda. So Zainab, yes, that's what I had. I prepared briefly to give a picture of energy here in Kavale, Uganda, and also the alternatives we are trying to apply to reduce the, the, the weight of the print, of the footprint on our environment. Thank you very much, Rev. Um, do you have the pictures open so you can share screen? Yes. Um, we've, um, Clo has just given you uh, share screen powers. I don't know what they call it, but powers to share screen. Um, if you could just give an example so people can see, because it's, it's, it's always good to visualize these things. Yeah, okay. So where do I share from so the you will, yeah, you will see at the bottom, it says in green, it says share screen, then you just click on the arrow. Okay. And then it will open up whatever is open um, on your screen. Yes. So when you click on the picture, if it's open, uh, we will see it. So is it seen now because... Have you, have you clicked on the picture? Yes, I have clicked on the PowerPoint presentation that I had prepared. Okay, it's not showing now. So you have to click on in Zoom, you have to click on the green screen share um, icon at the bottom first, then it will open up okay. your screen. And then you just select whichever one you want to open. There we go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh. Okay. We all learn at some point. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So there you go now. It's the energy saving alternatives in Uganda. That's what I had been talking about. Yes. We have the energy sources in Uganda there, traditional sources, firewood, which is still the main source in rural areas. It's also used in the same urban areas. Then we have kerosene or paraffin oil, which is used mainly for lighting. Then we have the charcoal. This is the main source of cooking energy in all urban areas and also in rural areas. Then in the recent past, we've had hydro or electricity for lighting but rarely used for cooking, like I mentioned, because of the cost involved. There are also small solar, small solar panels for only light. You may find a house has one or two lights. These are is scattered in our rural areas. And there is also the use of solar lamps. These are still very limited to the ordinary citizen due to the cost involved. So the main source is still charcoal and firewood, which is not environment, of environment friendly. So then is some of the alternatives that we have there, you see they're like you have the energy saving stoves. This can use either charcoal or firewood, but uses about 40% fuel of, or, of the usual from uh, that which from the one which would be used the, by the other normal stuff and the, this one at least uh, we, we use this one at home for cooking and then this is the cooking stones 
but which are built up, they use less firewood, but, uh, but the advantage with it that one can put one or two, three saucepans in the same cooking mm -hmm. area. And then uh, I had that Kim calls this, they called this the wonder bags, but they mm -hmm. are, they, we, we call them the, we, we, we call them the fireless cooker. And uh, as I was concluding, I said that uh, while we are promoting this, but uh, usually the compliance, the people, people change lifestyle, people moving from one source to another, one lifestyle to another is still very low. But we hope that as we do this with others in the faith community, they will be able to also to, to, to reduce our footprint to on the on the on the, on the environment. Thank you very much. Hmm. Thank you very much, Rev. I think this is wonderful. I just love that fireless cooker, what we call Wonder Bag, but it also shows that there's different ways and uh, uh, that you can make your own, actually. Um, if you just think about it uh, and, and yeah, amazing. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, I will stop the sharing. Could okay. I just ask, there's, there's a few people like Nokia too and, um, and others that we don't, we don't know who is joining us if we can't see your name. Please could you rename yourself so we can see, because we also have to record who's on this call that has registered. Um, so please rename yourself. If you are, are unable to rename yourself um, and don't know how or anything, please just send me um, in the chat box your name and I can do it for you. Uh, thank you. Um, Aya, uh, Norman, I see your, your hand is up. We are doing questions and answers or any comments um, after the presentations. So if you could just lower your hand and add to the um, chat box, please. Um, we'll move on to Sheikh Kasim, um, our favorite Sheikh um, from Malawi. Sheikh Amini, I know you on the school, so I'm, I'm not I'm, I, I'm not choosing between the two of you. Um, Sheikh Kasim has been with us, has been working with um, with Safsi for for about six, seven years already. And he is um, the first of the graduates of the first cohort of the fleet program, um, the regional fleet program. Um, and he's also the director of Al Anbaya Foundation in Malawi. Um, and he's of the Islamic faith group. So that's just a bit about Sheikh Kasim Chikwakwa. Um, and he's going to give us, he's been working, he's a very proactive um, faith leader <coughs> in Malawi, and he's going to give us his experience and work, uh, tell us a, a bit about, a bit more about that, um, what he's been doing in Malawi. Sheikh? Sheikh, you're on mute, Sheikh. You have to unmute, just unmute yourself. There we go. Ah, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, indeed, I'm Sheikh Kasim Chikwauko from Malawi. As Zainab has already said, I'm the director of Alambia Foundation. And I'm here to present on energy alternatives in Malawi. But in the first place, I would like to share with you energy. I think the background of energy in Malawi before I go to my, what I really um, do here in Malawi. Like in many countries worldwide, gathering firewood in Malawi is the etadias back-breaking exercise, which entails walking further and further from home as traditional forest resources are depleted faster than they are being replanted. Typically, 75% of the harvested wood 
is used for household cooking in Malawi. Other uses of firewood include tobacco curing and brick burning. It is very frustrating because most people, especially in uh, per urban and urban areas, and urban areas cannot um, access cannot. electricity. And rather, and the rural areas can only access electricity because the state-owned electricity supply has failed to ad uh, adequately save the small Southern African uh, country over 50 years after gaining independence from Britain. To date, around eight to 10% of the country, the country's population over, uh, over approximately 18 million have access to hydroelectricity generated by ESCOM, forcing the rest of the population, the population to heavily to depend on firewood as the main energy source. Um, my fellow colleagues, of the 8 to 10 percent, less than 2 percent of the connected is in the rural areas. Most international organizations here in Malawi have put in place through Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources a number of interventions to support and, and pro promote community level initiatives that address global diversity. Climate change, um, international waters, and the ozone layer. The idea is to enable the majority of Malawi access the alternative and affordable energy for their social economic development. According to the Ministry of Environment, uh, uh, Environmental Affairs, deforestation claims more than 50,000 hectares of trees every year against 8,000 that are repl replanted. Deforestation has over the years contributed to increased soil erosion, flash floods, lowering of water tables, siltation of dams, lakes and rivers, and loss of soil fertility. All very demanding for an economy which is dependent on agriculture. Although solar energy has been around for a long time and its advantages ranging from its cleanliness to renewability have been touted over the years, not much has happened in Malawi. A land with about 3000 hours of sunlight, sunshine per year. We have a model solar village in Mangochi that is in one of, one of the country's lakeshore districts, but we have failed to pick up the experience and replicate it elsewhere. The model solar powered village was set up in the year 1990s to help demonstrate the benefits of solar technology. The country also tried biogas where animal waste is used to produce methane gas for lighting and cooking without much success, mainly because most Malawians cannot afford biogas digesters. According to Malawi Industrial Research and Technological Center, biogas digesters cost between 500 to 1,000 US dollars in an effort to complement government's efforts, our organization, which is known as Alambia Foundation and the Muslim Association of Malawi, has embarked on an, an, um, has embarked on a, another energy alternative, which is briquettes making. Briquettes are a source of energy locally made from virtually all agricultural waste even old papers and cardboards, which are compressed using a simple level operated press or a traditional African mortar and pistol. They are, they are 
dwarf nut shaped and are 30% cheaper than the wood sold in towns. For many rural women who are traditionally responsible for gathering firewood, the various stages of producing briquettes, which is part of our work, will be, prom um, will be promoted under this initiative. Briquette making is, is less time consuming and less back breaking than uh, the quest for wood. The briquettes which are produced are in two, two which we produce are in two, two forms. The paper and cardboard briquettes, and we have um, bamboo made briquettes made from exotic bamboos. So colleagues, this is an example of a paper made briquette. So we have uh, these in stock, we have a lot of them that we produce with our uh, um, uh, youths, uh, more especially in various schools in the central region. So these are, are, are produced just to alternate with the energy that we use here. Currently, we have distributed about 3,000 bamboo seedlings to the women across three districts of Lilongwe in the central region, and then uh, Machinga in the southern region, and the Rumpi in the northern part of Malawi. Bamboos will replace trees in the next three to five years to come. So the initiative of briquette making has also been, been rolled out in schools, like I said earlier, especially in Lilongwe targeting the youths who constitute almost 80% of Malawi's population. Um, I think we'll, we'll continue doing this on our, our limiting factor as of now, our resources, which we are praying to God that I think should provide us with a lot of resources to reach out to as many youths as possible. So these are some of the uh, things that we do here. Unfortunately, I haven't um, brought with me the bamboo briquettes. In fact, I was trying to check with our stores, but they are not there right now. I'm sure next time, once we uh, get them ready, I'll present them to you. So my fellow colleagues, these are some of the things that we are doing in order to alternate um, um, electricity, charcoal, and some other energy sources in Malawi. I thank you so much. May God, may God bless you all. Thank you. Hello, Zainab. Yes, Sheikh. Sorry, I just got distracted. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sheikh Kasim, for that um, perspective on energy and, and the alternative um, ways of um, using electric, um, energy. Um, I'm always very amazed about the things that you come up with in your head um, and then you just run with it. And I think that that's always so cool to have that, um, to have these ideas um, I'd, I'd like to, you were speaking about the biogas digester and there's somebody on this call, Lydia Peterson. Um, Lydia, are you here? Lydia, can you hear me? Hi, good afternoon. How's everybody? Hi, fine, thank you and yourself, Lydia. I'm very well, thank you. I was just busy texting um, Reverend Berry when I heard my name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. She probably asked, asked you if you could explain a bit more about how you, um, how the project about your, the bio, um, biogas digester that you, um, that you did. Um, is it fine if you could just give us a brief, a brief kind of um, presentation on it? 
Yes, certainly. Can I keep my video off or do you want it yes, on? Yes, that's fine. That's fine. We can hear you okay. clearly. Um, thank you for this opportunity um, and greetings to my brothers and sisters in Malawi, Uganda, South Africa. Um, I've started a biogas project about a year ago. And unfortunately for me, I started it in the middle of um, winter. So the, um, the results were not that good. Um, like Kim has also said that in the beginning, that your um, alternative energy and your eco footprint is a journey, it's not a quick fix. Mm. So I've started this and it healed it only results after I think about three to four months. Whereas um, I had to do some innovative things as to how to create more heat for the, um, for the um, matter to work. So I had to put like a blanket around the, um, the digester and <laughs> it felt like an electric blanket at the time. So that yielded me about two hours of cooking um, per day. And um, it, I'm, I'm in the process of installing another one where I will be doing um, instructional video, which I um, hopefully can share also to this group. And um, that will be most probably within a month or so. Um, I've used um, organic waste, which will be anything from um, your kitchen waste to, to agricultural. Um, I've used dried leaves, I've used dried grass, cut grass cuttings, and all that went into that digester. And like I said, it was a bit challenging in the beginning um, because yeah, of um, yeah. you know, um, with, um, renewable energy, it depends on the weather. So we had to um, improvise where that was concerned. And like I said, it's not a quick fix. It took us about three months to heal um, two hours of cooking gas. Um, I know that um, we are not encouraged to do the animal dung because of um, climate change, the impact it has. So there is something called agricultural lime, which I am in the process of um, using on one just to see what are the results and just do a little bit more research on the agricultural lime and see how that pans out and then i can also share with the group at some later stage great thank you very much lydia um i'm sure that um when you have your end product uh, that we will share with others as well i think it's very inspiring that you're not just giving up um, on, on what's not working, but looking at, at other things. Um, no, definitely. I, I didn't, I wasn't even thinking of giving up. I was frustrated in the beginning, yes, because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because you know you want something to work. And it yes. took a lot of uh, um, um, patience, I would say. Yeah. And then always the um, kitchen waste and the um, organic waste were not um, readily available. So I had mm -hmm. to, like I say, improvise. And I, wherever the, the city of Cape Town used to cut grass in, 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 in the road, I would collect, I would stand there with a bag and then I would just collect the grass cuttings. <laughs> yeah. And then I used yeah. to make my own compost. And then I started with, with you see, with the, um, with the biogas, the slurry, the that you have remaining after you've now collected the methane. So that is an organic fertilizer, which can be used for your gardens and things like that. So um, there's quite a few um, alternative energy um, projects that I'm busy with. Um, there's, um, can I say it? <laughs> yeah. There is one that I'm busy with now. I've started and there's a snag. I don't know what the snag is, so I now need to go find out what it is but it's actually to produce energy from salt water. Um, and um, if you do not have like um, readily available salt water from the ocean, you can make your own salt water, but um, everything just has to be right. So I need to get it yeah. right before I can really share. But I've been working on that one now for a couple of days and hopefully by the end of the week, I will have an instructional mm. video about that as well, because it's mm. all about keeping our carbon footprint low as well as seeking alternative energy to um, because of load shedding and everything yeah yeah thank you for the thank you very much thank you thank you very much Lydia um, thank you very much to Kim uh, Sheikh Magambo and and Sheikh Kasim for the three perspectives and different context of um, 
energy and alternatives. I'm trying to see if there's any questions. I do see that everyone um, liked the presentations and are requesting the present uh, are requesting the copies of the presentations. Um, and I saw that there was a request for the pictures and and I think a short clip of how the wonder bag um, works. Um, if there's any quick any questions, please add them to the to the chat box. I see there's a lot of comments um, and people saying great presentations, but I don't see any any questions. There's a question. Yes, Justice. Yeah, Hello. As, um, there's a question that I actually I was saying, what is the church's message about uh, our role as the stewards of the earth with regards to climate change? Thank you. I saw that and I'm trying to scroll down from the top to see if I'm not missing anything. Um, uh, Reverend Chigambo? Would you like to answer that, and then I'll and then I'll also ask Sheikh Kasim um, if he could respond to that in a Islamic perspective because we multi faith, so we we will do mm. um, both. Yeah, like uh, to me, we the mandate we have to take care of the creation and the environment comes from right from the beginning of creation when God created the created the the Garden of Eden. When I look at it, let me take it from my opinion and the, 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 the ideology that I use or the approach I use and the conviction actually, not only that, but the, also the conviction as well, is that I see in the book of Genesis, God like prepared the, the garden like paradise for man to live in. And when he had finished creating, then he presented man into it. And then he, when he put him there, the mandate was clear to him was to till and tend, to, to, to make it produce, but also to take care of it. So to me, that is a very ultimate mandate for the, for, for the, for the church, a Christian community as the church to, to take care of the, of the environment, to make sure that he, the, the hygiene, the, a good environment, and the, basically it's around that idea of the great mandate to take care of the land. And even when we go through, it doesn't end there. When we go through the scriptures, like we see in other scriptures that he, while we are living in this foreign world, the way it is, as we wait for our salvation and redemption as children of God, also the earth, the world, the created world is also waiting for that. He, that redemption, actually, they in using the scripture, the Bible language, it says they're waiting for the redemption of the sons of man. And the world is also groaning for that. So when we come to be, to have the conviction of God, when God touches our hearts, he also touches our hearts to care for the environment. I don't know whether I I tried to articulate it the way yeah. the, the question was asked, but to me, I see that a full mandate from the scriptures that actually taking care of the environment is very much as important as take care, taking care of my other brothers and sisters around me. Thank you very much. Right. Justin, um, uh, how, yeah. Right. If I have a question, I, I think he partly answered. Was, um, I'm a bit worried. Why? Because um, as the church, are we actually having time? maybe say to talk about it in our you know different churches or religions where we actually you know preach the word of god because sometimes yes on these platforms we can uh, i mean say this but what is actually obtaining on the ground is totally different are we really being are, are we really true stewards of the environment or the christians or you know those who belong to various you know religions are the ones who are actually messing up with the environment or actually wantonly i mean destroying the forest what is the position, the actual position of the church? Are we really preaching or are we living, are we, are we walking the talk as the church? Mm. I understand that. I'm, I'm going to give, uh, Sheikh Kasim, do you, 
uh, do you want to respond to that? I just want to respond to justice as well um, from a SAFSI perspective. I think that we at a stage in climate change where there is no turning, where there is no turning back really. And, and for us working with, with faith communities, that is exactly what we are saying. It's, it's the time now to stand up and speak to your community, to your faith community about the importance of conserving the environment and the importance of, um, well, not changing, but moving your, your ser sermons to speak about um, stewardship, planting trees, um, deforestation, why it's, why it's um, um, damaging the, the community and adding to climate change. And I think that we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves, um, Justice. If, if it, it, it's not a kind of um, one, si one size fits all. Um, um, a pre presentation or, or what we're trying to, or what we're doing but we, we but we are working towards it and I think for faith communities they are working towards it as well I think in our fleet program in our in our faith leader um, program there's a lot of work that 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 goes on um, that we also don't see because it's not done in the churches or it's not preached preached in the um, in the parishes, but there's a lot of um, faith leaders that is taking on the responsibility. So it might not be all of them, but but it is happening. Um, and I think it's a, it's a it's a, it sometimes looks too slow, um, but we shouldn't disregard those that's doing a lot. And we can see a lot of faith leaders on this call as well that's doing amazing work. Um, yeah. We just need to get to all of them at some point. Um, Sheikh Kasim? Um, I see just, Precious uh, James and Lydia. Lydia, you were first, but I wanted to give Sheikh Kasim a chance to respond on the um, Muslim Islamic perspective. Yeah, Zainab, indeed, what uh, the, uh, the one was asking, who is asking this question? is saying that why is it that um, we preach what, what we preach but uh, it looks like uh, nothing is is happening on the ground um we cannot run away from that because as the preachers we do preach not only about environment we preach uh, about uh, the, the human behavior or in terms of corruption fornication and what have you but still in the church or in the mosque, you still find people who are fornicators. You still find people who are corrupt. So according to the Quran, we are just there as the warners, as, as people who can, just, who, who can warn the, uh, the, the, the people. But guidance is with the almighty God. We cannot force people to turn their hearts to, 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 to God or to the, to, to, to the environment. But our work is just to keep on preaching, keep on preaching. But at some time, um, some point, they will actually change. Because much as we are preach, I think that will go into the hearts of the, uh, the people. But we cannot actually force people to, because wherever they go, we are not with them. What we put across the message, and that is what the Quran says. We are just there to give warning to them. To, 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 to guide them, uh, but uh, for them to repent, uh, for them to behave uh, normally or as what God is asking them to do or is demanding them to do is, uh, and that is left to uh, uh, God alone. So uh, just to answer the question, um, I think that's what I can uh, mm. say, Zaina. Thank you very much. That is, yeah, thank you very much, Sheikh Kasim. Sheikh Kasim that is very well said. Let's guide. Um, Lydia, your hand was up first, and then I'll go to James, and then Precious. Hi, um, I just heard that somebody asked if the video of the Wonder Bag can be shared. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there is one available, a video like that. 
Um, I've started on this Wonder Bag production quite a while back, but I've never done like a presentation because I was just giving it out to the community and at um, yeah. feeding schemes. So I would love to make um, a, a video like that and share it to, to the group or to SAFSI, um, say within two weeks from now, and then everybody can share it. Will that be okay? Yeah, yeah we'll certainly share it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, Kim in, in the chat box has also give a, uh, given a description that you can read through. Um, James, you had a question? James? No, Precious? Yes, yes. Hi. Hello, hello. Uh, actually, my question goes to Sheikh Kassim. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you so much for giving me this platform, giving me this opportunity to ask. My question is that, um, Sheikh Kassim, you eventually agree with you eventually agree with me that uh, the use of fire and charcoal are the common sources of energy mostly here in Malawi, right? Mm. Yes. Despite it being environmentally cautious. So I'm trying to say that uh, you can't just tell someone to change from one source to another without fully convincing him intellectually. My point is what effort or what kind of implementation are you doing on the ground to change people's mind? for them to adopt such new ideas? What effort have you put in place? That's my question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Precious. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you so much, my dear brother. Uh, just to answer your question, uh, every journey starts with a, 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 a step. Yes, what, we, what we are doing now, we, are, we have targeted a few uh, schools and the uh, selected communities where we are working with. I think those yeah. people will bring the message now to other people, will bring, will bring the message to other people. Uh, as, you are, as you are aware that uh, uh, most of the organizations here in Malawi have got a, a, a limitation in terms of uh, finances. So to reach out to, to the, as many people as, the, as, the, as you may wish to, it's, it's finances are, are just a, a limiting factor. But what we are doing, we are preaching to, we are, we are working with a small community. That small community will, will convey the message as well as the skills to other people. So this is a long-term plan. What, 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 what we are sowing today, I think the seeds will be taken to other people uh, in 10, 15 years to come. So we cannot change the people just for, for a day or two. It, it takes time, my dear brother. So we are working. Okay. Yes. Okay, Sheikh Kasim, uh, I think you can agree with me that uh, time is no longer on our side. Destruction of environment in Malawi is at its worst and at its best, right? So mm -hmm. if you had to take 15 years to come, I think there will be no time to conserve. What if you reduce the years and what if you put more effort <laughs> to implement? I think change is based on implementation. Yeah, I, I know that, but dear yeah. brother, you must know that change doesn't yeah. come overnight. Exactly. Change doesn't change doesn't come overnight. I, I, I can I can take you to yes, you want to talk? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm 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 gonna. I'd just like to add to to um, what is being discussed here between uh, um, and 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 listening to Precious's um, question. I think that we, what we need to realize is that any change is, is not only for one person. And if, yeah. we, if we look at the, um, um, the challenges within Malawi, we can't expect one person to, um, to solve the problems of every person. I think, I think the question is, are you able then to partner with Sheikh Kasim so that he can yeah, he yeah. can uh, yeah. work with you or you can work with him to be able to bring that into your community? Yes, yes. Because in that way, it goes faster. And I think it also goes to Justice's question earlier as how much time do we have and, and what are we doing on the ground to be able to preach what the faith community is doing? And faith communities is us. So we shouldn't look 
at the faith leaders only in what are you doing? What are your, what changes are you making? But how can we, as people believing in, in um, the almighty or God, people of faith, what, what are we bringing to the table and how can we um, assist and improve um, our responsibility as, as, as stewards of creation? And I just wanted to add on what you have said, Zainab. I thought my dear brother would say, yeah. where, where can I find you, my dear brother, so that I can <laughs> acquire the skills and, 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 let, and, and pass it to and Because I cannot do it alone. There yeah, are so yes, many Malawi. We will there share so your many, details. Yeah, so we are, there, are so, there are so many Malawians here, I think, yeah. on, on the... Yeah, on on, 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 the, on this meeting, there are so many Malawians. Okay. So if, thank if you. I have shared. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you very much, Precious. Thank you, Chef Kasim. And we're gonna go on to the next hand. We have three more, three, three more hands. Um, I don't know who one X M8 is. I think his name is Justin. Check shirt, yeah. Okay, Justin, you have a question, then we go to um, Aya and then Che. Justin, you're on mute. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm just in comment. Actually, I just, I just want to give a general comment on what has been said already. The first comment that I want to say is from experience perspective. I'm a Pakistan life officer. What I do is conservation. <clears throat> now in conservation, most of the malaria mentioned parks and life areas, we find that a lot of people are not yet understanding what it's all about to conserve the wildlife. They think, and in fact, as we talk about the environmental friendliness and environmental taking care of the environment, people think it's something to do only with you know, things that are outwardly, not internally. Internally, I'm trying to, to refer you guys on the first, uh, first thing, the, the spiritual life. In the spiritual life, you find out that, for example, in Islam, Rasulullah, the prophet, teaches mm -hmm. us to say, whosoever plants a tree, and then everyone who comes and benefits from that tree, the one who has planted, they found that the one who has planted the tree will get a benefit, the, the benefit from whosoever benefits from that tree. Another example from the same uh, angle, this says, whosoever takes care of something, for example, you see something going wrong, you know, the way Malawians are, are destroying the environment, and then you teach them, you see if you educate them. The way you do it, and why someone sees it as an example and then he tries and do it because you have seen you doing that, it's an act of worship. Because you're in a good example, you set a good example for the humankind and then the other follows you, you become the one who has, who has successfully made a very good uh, community. Now, in this, what I want to point on is that for us Malawians to be able to know the benefits or the importance of saving our environment, conserving our wildlife and so on, the first thing we need to do is to civic, civic educate one another through our places of worship in the mosques, in the churches. The true. only challenge we're having right now is that, is, is that a lot of people, they leave things in the hands of the leaders. If the leader says this, we will follow. If he doesn't say, even if he's going along, we will leave it like that. That's the only point that I want to be here so that every human being, every Malawian and every every human being on the earth can have the responsibility of taking care of the environment only if we understand what is the importance of the environment. So for us to understand, like I said earlier, we need to educate one another about that point of environment. Let me hold on for, for that. Maybe if, if there are the other comment, inshallah. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Um, Thank you. We have so many hands up. Precious, you have asked your question already, so I'm going to put your hand um, down. And we only have about, well, seven minutes to go. Um, 
I'll go with um, Aya first and then Che. I'm not C H E, is that just Che? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, Aya, you want to go first? You're on mute. Ah, uh, I can get it. Okay. Sorry, be be before you go. Uh -huh. I hear your, is your mic on? I am Imani Nsume. I've used the Nsume, but my name is Imani Nsume. Okay. Yes, uh, mine was just also a comment uh, to what has transpired from the conversation that has just ended between uh, the Sheikh and the, uh, this brother. I think from the conversation, what I've gotten is that uh, the Sheikh was saying uh, our roles as preachers, as faith leaders, are just there to warn uh, the people of uh, what is good for them to do. But uh, then I was looking at, in, terms, uh, in, in the perspective of involvement advocacy, uh, we have done a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Reaching this far, we wouldn't say that people aren't aware that the taking care of the environment is so good and uh, is so admit. People are aware of that. People really know that uh, taking good care of the environment is really a good thing that we can uh, put in practice. And also uh, the bad part of uh, depleting the environment, uh, people are aware of that in terms of advocacy. So I wanted to say that uh, it is high time that we would put in practice our preaching. What we preach should be put in practice. Uh, for example, as the faith leaders, uh, we need uh, uh, to be involved to take care of the environment but by, showing, by, by being uh, exemplary, by showing people uh, the act of taking good, good, good care of the environment. And that is uh, possible if we explore what other people are doing, what the literature is saying about taking good care of the environment, and also, again, being innovative in as far as taking good care of the environment is concerned. I think if we put in practice, uh, for example, uh, if we say uh, as Muslims or as the uh, faith leaders, planting a tree uh, is so admit. If our followers see, see us planting a tree and they are looking at the benefits, I think it will be easy for them to adopt that. Another thing is the, uh, the collaboration, because uh, I heard uh, the, 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 the brother was asking uh, the sheikh, what are you doing in terms of this? Then if we collaborate, uh, for example, here in Malawi, we have, a, we have got a, uh, some participants here who are in different parts of Malawi, some from Lilongwe, others from the southern region, others from the north. If we adopt what the people in the north are doing and implement that in the southern region, I think he, uh, by, by engaging uh, our followers in uh, several small projects, the cleaning of the environment, by actually doing the thing, I think that would, would really help us by moving, diverting from the advocacy. As we are advocating, we should also involve in implementing what we are advocating. I think that would take us a mile to somewhere else. Otherwise, I pause for now. I just wanted to comment uh, on what has transpired uh, from the last conversation, that we need to divert from, uh, from advocacy as we're advocating. We need to put that into practice and also collaboration. And the collaboration doesn't mean that we need to be at, at one place. We can just explore what others are doing from this side and implementing the other side. Thank you very much. I, that, that's China, very helpful China. as putting putting advocacy into action and collaborating. I think you, you've mentioned two strong, very strong oh. words. Um, yeah, it's, yes, Chef. Yeah, I just yes, want sir. to, yeah, I just want to concur with the, that brother. If, they, if the people listen to my presentation well, I, I said that we, as we are preaching, and at the same time, we are into action. I said that we have so far distributed about 3,000 bamboos, and that's an action. And here with me is a brigade. This is also an action, not only saying, but also doing it. So that's what we are doing now. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh. 
So it's about collaborating and action in, yeah, in, in, well, not only in Malawi, because you are speaking in the context of Malawi, but I think yeah. everywhere. It's yeah, time for right. action now. Exactly. Um, I, we have three minutes left, and I know that Jail, Jalivan, um, I'm going to go to Aia. You want to check your mic for me, please? And then Jalivan, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not pronouncing that correctly. And Joseph, my brother, happy? I am so sorry, but we're going to have to miss your comment, unfortunately, because we're running out of time. Um, so Ahia, can you want to go? Uh, we, Ahia, we are not, we cannot hear you. Hello. Are you getting me? Yes, I'm getting you. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I say that uh, thank you very much for giving me such, given God an opportunity uh, to be in this platform and clarify more on, uh, on this subject that matters. Yeah, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, the great work done, done by uh, NGOs and uh, uh, faith readers and all, all, all of the work that has been uh, taking place to make sure that we, we heal the environment and the, we shine together. You know, it, it, is, it is not easy and it's also very difficult to come to this point, but uh, I would like to elaborate on uh, the issue concerning uh, uh, a, a climate change policy, uh, which has been uh, not uh, been negotiated for so long. Uh, for example, whenever we, we are taking some actions, uh, we need also to, to make sure that we engage uh, people from uh, different sectors. And uh, whenever we are engaging people from uh, different sectors, we found that we are hearing others and uh, we found that we are getting other people involved in what we are uh, doing in the electric. Uh, so look at uh, a country like Malawi, and we have a, a national policy that uh, it is looking not only at um, plastic papers, but also considering waste produced at the household level. So mm -hmm. by looking much at this issue, we, we can uh, come up with a point and uh, try to make sure that waste are to be managed at a household level because we know that the source of uh, waste or the source of uh, climate change is, is based uh, literally on man, the behavior of man, what man has been doing so far and what man is uh, been doing so far to destroy the, 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 the planet. So when yeah. we look to this issue, we, we have to tackle actions that are very important and making sure that uh, this action uh, must be considered. So we need uh, advocacy and we, look, uh, we need to look at a, a very strong policy that the government, that NGOs, that faith leaders and people at the community level should be considering to make mm -hmm. sure that we are working together hand in hand and make sure that we can heal and shine together. Otherwise, thank you very much. Aya. I think those are very important issues. And I think household household waste, especially is a huge, huge topic. Um, but I have to say that house well waste in general, we will we will look at that um, in our third in our third week of this um, of this webinar. And that will be on the fifth. Oh, goodness. Um, uh, yeah, on the 5th of July. So we will come back next week on the 28th. We will do water. We will look at water um, and how we use water and how can we use water bet better as a, as, a re as a natural resource. And then also looking at waste the, the week after that. So thank you very much for that contribution. Um, thank yeah, thank you. Well, thank uh, Joseph? You. Yeah, I would like to finish by uh, saying yeah. this, that we, we appreciate the, the, the hard work you are working. And, Thank uh, you, we, yeah. Yes, we have been also working very hard to make sure that we can help the environment together.
but we're not sure and we're not connected with this so that we can collaborate together, empower each and everyone and work together to make sure that we are healing the environment. Thank yeah. you very much. Collaboration and action. Those are the two words I'm taking with me from the school. Um, uh, Joseph? Oh, we can't hear you, Joseph. Who's in? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you, we, we are running out of time. We are over time. Can you please keep it short? Uh, okay, I'll keep it short. I uh, just wanted to Thank add you on what Kasim said about the thing of briquet. We have another procedures of, of how we do this. Like in the late show, yes, we have a of uh, rice that we all make briquets from classics of rice. Where I see things from Carol, from Carlos. So I just want to him that we have the way how we make it. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. Then we need so to Sheikh, share. Sheikh Kassim, yeah, do you, to... yeah I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Do you want to repeat what was said? Yeah, I said we need to share. I think we need to share what, what, what I know and what he knows we need to share. Yeah, collaboration and action. Collaboration and action, that is yeah. good. Okay, so thank I you. think that we should end this call now. I would like to say thank you very much to everyone who has participated. This was, this was quite interactive um, now at the end, which is all, always, um, always, uh, um, uh, appreciated from our side. We will, we will be doing the next one, which is on water uh, next week, Monday, and starting at 11. Um, so please, if you haven't registered for that, please register for that um, and, and send us an email. I will share, um, Chloe, uh, please could you share um, your email address, my email address um, on here, and Kim, um, Kim, um, Sheikh Kasim, and Reverend Mogambo, please could you share your email addresses on here so people can um, people can copy it if they have any questions of collaboration and action and how they can collaborate with you in the um, um, in future or get hold of you in future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will ask Reverend Andrew, how are you? Well, I'm very well. How are you, Zaina? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. I'm gonna ask nice. you. To, I'm gonna ask Thank you, you. Could I ask you to close us with a prayer, please? All right. Shall we pray? Yeah. Shall let we me pray? just let me just thank oh. Kim again, um, uh, Reverend um, she, she Gambo, I can't see you anymore. And Sheikh Kasim, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, you. It's highly appreciated, and we've learned so much from all three countries, from all three perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Reverend Gwambe. Thank you, thank you, Zainab. Thank you very much too. Now he has frozen. Sheikh Ishmael, I see you. Can you close us, please? Are you hearing me? I can. Thank you. Uh, in Islam, we don't close eyes. Let's just pray. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the time given. Give us effort to implement all strategies that you have discussed here. 
dear Lord, give us health life that next time we must also meet here and have a fruitful discussions. God, accept us. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone from CFC. Um, we appreciate you. Um, thank you very much for joining us on this call. And we hope that you've learned um, a lot, as we always do. Thank you. So thank Bye -bye. you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.